Bubba's, so they did something about it. They did the mirror, mirror, they made it work. There were times when me and Bubba were kind of out there, you know, trying to do the same means to the end, create a riot, get people offended, make people want to hop the rail, whatever it was. So I needed to be different from him. And he, of course, as the physical enforcer type, was going to be the one that I felt needed to be hated more than I did. So if I needed to take a step sideways from being a monster heel and getting the kind of, I hate this guy, he's a fish out of water, why is he with these Dudleys anyway? If, if Bubba needed to be at that moment the bigger heel. So long story short, I started to be a little bit too well liked for what I was doing. A little bit too, you know, fans wanting to slap my hand coming down the aisle, a little too tweener, a little too baby face. And uh, I don't know if I slapped somebody's hand back or smiled at them instead of smirked at them. I don't know what Paul saw that night. But when we came to the back, Paul pulled me aside loud enough for everybody to hear, but not to, you know, rub my face into it, but loud enough for everybody to hear because if you listened and didn't take offense and didn't take it personal and it was just business, it wasn't anything bad that he was saying. And it took me a moment to process it, but I realized it when I took him for face value verbatim. He said, right now, to me, as a heel, you are a million dollars. As a baby face, you are worthless. I don't need you. So that's a character refresh right there. That's that's cold water in the face, like, okay, you know, I could want to help Bubba personally, thinking as a wrestling student that he needs more heel heat right now than I do. So maybe I should just be goofier, be more affable, be more relatable, friendly, whatever. But uh, but it still at that moment wasn't what Paul was looking for. And he let me know, right? The soup's cold versus the spoon's dirty, right? He told me exactly what it was that was wrong. Uh, and, and it was up to me to come up with how to fix it. So. And to the point earlier, that means being coachable. Being coachable, yeah, because some, some people would, you know, it would be, you know, it would be a splinter under their fingernail, you know what I mean? They would let it, they would get hyped up about it, and it was nothing to get hyped up about. You know, it was, I mean, that's the first time he emoted in that way in four years, maybe, that I've been working for him. So it's not like, why get offended if it's not a regular occurrence anyway? You know what I mean? And it was a valid point. So, and then the other, the cousin of that, the variation on the theme for the complacency is towards the end of ECW when it was finishing up, but before it did, before it did, so maybe late 2000, I hope it was late 2000, I hope it wasn't as early as mid 2000, but towards the end, but not at the end. Once a week I would go into Westchester, to Pelham, New York, and we would do uh, TNN. We would cut TNN, we'd stand in Ron Buffon, the cameraman's parents' house basement, and we would have the ECW banner up, and you know, everything that, if you read the book, Rise and Fall of ECW, or if you saw the DVD or whatever, you probably know the story. And we would do that once a week, you know, when the tapes were back from the town, and whatever. And there was one, whatever it was, Tuesday or Wednesday, and I mean, I don't know why I was feeling this way. I love wrestling. I love the ECW. I don't know what it was. And I wasn't overworked. It wasn't like the 80s when the guys were on the road 350 days a year. It wasn't even a current WWE schedule. It was when you were doing TV, it was maybe uh, two days on the weekend in a town. And then the one day driving local doing it. So it was like a three day a week job, not five, not six, not seven. And I had been to the point, I, in 1997, I had a shoot job to support my wrestling habit, and I worked in ECW. And that year, between the two, I was working a night audit at a hotel, so I was graveyard shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. That year, if you count the days that I worked at the hotel, and the days that I worked on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, not at the hotel, in ECW, I think I worked 362 days that year, and I had three days off. And I would be at like a Friday spot show in New England, and I'd be, you know, wearing my neck brace and bow tie sitting in a chair like this, and we'd be like second to last, we'd be like match seven, and it would be like match five, 
and maybe I already had my verbiage and I knew what the spots were, and I'd sit in the chair and fall asleep with the neck brace on as I'm sitting crushing my larynx, because I was, you know, but, but you do it. But so in the TNN days, it was nothing like that. It was more like three days a week. And there was this one Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day it was, that we were doing production for the Friday show. And I just wasn't feeling it. I don't know if it was a that day thing or a that week thing, or I was just, I, I, just like we all say about different things at different times, it was that one week, hopefully the only, hopefully not the first of many, but hopefully the only week. And I just had this feeling run through me, like, God, I wish I didn't have to go in today. I wish I didn't have to go to TV. You talk about complacency, right? And then like, probably six months over, uh, six months later, there was no TV to go to the company anymore. So uh, appreciate what you have while you have it, make the most of it. Uh, we can see now, now it's obvious, back in the 80s and in the territory days, whenever 70s, you know, whatever your favorite wrestling is, there were times before this where we didn't know that everything was archived. That everything needed to be evergreen. That there was a network, that there was streaming, that there was YouTube. There was a time when it was more like hard media, like DVDs and VHS. There was a time before that where if you didn't catch TV in the 60s, you missed TV. And you just didn't have it. So, now that we know, just know that the people who are watching you and anybody who's going to watch it later down the bike, it, it's for everybody. It's etched. And you have to always not just want to be in the moment and love what you're doing as you're doing it and for the people in that crowd who you're doing it for, watching that week's TV and that week's TV viewership. But you have to do it because not only is there a chance which we were maybe thinking in the 90s and the early 2000s as technology was burgeoning. But now as we're going into the 20s, we know that there's not just a chance, but there's the reality that everything you do for that product and for that wrestling office is meant to live forever. And uh, so that's it. You know, you have to not only be in the newspaper, but you have to be in the storybook. You know what I mean? You have to put yourself into history. So that's important. We'll get back to questions in just a second. I just have a quick point to make something that you mentioned where your character, when you're building your character is, I think the phrase you used was, it's the best of who you are. And if you're a heel, it can definitely be the worst of who you are. Um, two years ago, I did a seminar here at CAC alongside Jim Ross on the art of the promo. And the character that I've done since about 2012 now on the Indies in the West Coast is Bros of Joe Brody, which is as douchey as it sounds. And one of the very vocal aspects of the character is that he loves Nickelback. And I, see, see the reactions? And I, in real life, love Nickelback. That is not a rib, that is 100% true. And just like it did, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> But look at this photograph. <laughs> See? That's what I'm saying though. You take the best of your personality, or you take those parts of your personality that just make people roll their eyes. And there's when you get that reaction out of people, and I'm so happy you got that reaction out of you too as well, <laughs> then it goes a long way to getting your character over. That's the only little nugget that I want to share. Let's get back to questions because this has flown by already. Yes. story um we we did a few me and him in front of the banner with joey we did some stuff like uh him trying to hold joey back from attacking me and then i said something about paul and then all of a sudden they do a whole rehearsal and now joey's trying to hold paul back from uh gosh the jfk jr stuff uh that he let me do that he asked me to do, right? What do you do when the office asks you to do something? You put your spin on it and you do it. Uh, so that turned into a jeer on tvguide.com. <laughs> Cheers and jeers. <laughs> uh, and 
and, uh, and every time I fly out of JFK, I cross myself, and that's my local airport, and I'm Jewish. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, man. Paul, it's, I mean, not so much a story, but like, just, uh, just the opportunity he gave me, you know? Uh, he, he came up with quintessential stuff of him, and it was, uh, it was a throwback to Austin Idol, who he managed in Continental, in Alabama. And uh, he was a universal heartthrob, so I was the quintessential stuff of him. Complete throwback. Uh, I think I realized that after the fact, uh, and marked out for it. Um, he let me be the color guy, on his product where I used to watch him when he was the same age that I was at the time, early 20s, be the color guy for WCW. So when he needed to be Paul E with the badge, with the hat, and be who he was in his own company, he couldn't be Paul E dangerously as Paul E was in WCW. He needed one, he went to me. Uh, that was never lost on me. He managed Rick Rude coming up in WCW, and when Rude was with us, I did protagonist, antagonist stuff with Rude, point counterpoint stuff, where we were on the same plane as colleagues. That wasn't lost on me. So that's, aside from the story that I mentioned before, the anecdote where he said, you're worth a million as a heel, but I don't need you right now as a baby face. Uh, that and, and those other things probably come as close to a Paul Heyman story as I have. Uh, for me, Paul, uh, I was very, I, I thought this thing was two hours, so that's why I was, you know, stretching my interest a little bit. Yeah, I'll give you the uh, cliff notes. Um, for me and Paul, like, the first time I met Paul in the business, uh, I was very fortunate enough to, when I was trained with Al, uh, Sabu started running shows in Michigan as NWA. NWA Sabu, we called it. <laughs> and uh, Sabu would do this, these random run-ins on like a random match and just beat people up. They you know, could fire them up for the rest of the show and stuff like that. So they wanted to do this thing where uh, there would be a, a loser gets his head shaved match or whatever. And it was me and another student named Sean Brown. Uh, and they wanted to go out there and purposely just have this match and then try to do a thing where I don't even know how the stipulation would have worked, but it didn't matter at the end of the, the match because we're going to think we're, aha, we're not getting our head shaved or whatever. And then Sabu, who at the time, Sabu was booking ECW talent. He was booking Taz, he was booking Dreamer, uh, a whole bunch of them. He brought Paul Lee in for a show. So <coughs> Sabu and Paul Heyman, Paul Lee dangerously hit the ring on me and my buddy. And it was, I was getting my ass kicked, but it was the hardest thing not to smile, you know? So, yeah, Shabu nailed him, nailed me, you know, and, you know, uh, I learned from Paul. It's a little, little lessons you've learned along the way. And I'm down, he goes, he raises his phone to him, he goes, ah, and I knew to sit up, take another one. He would go, ah, I knew to sit up, take another one. So long story short, he stiffed with that phone. And Sabu was stiff with the razor, Sabu shaved their heads and all this stuff and gigged this with it. And long story short, I started jumping up to ECW and like I'm doing stuff, you know, here and there. And then it wasn't until we like went to, t I went to a, up to the studio at TV and Paulie goes, you're the kid who shaved his head. I was like, yeah. He's like, wow, that was cool. That he, he saw I was willing to do whatever it took, you know. Like he said, if you get a chance to ride a rocket ship, don't ask questions. Hey, me, you want me to shave your head? Yes. Paul, you want to be there? Yes. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. You know, I'm going to look like an idiot for a couple months, but, you know, why not? And it was just an opportunity. And then, um, you know, that Paul saw that as me taking initiative to be willing to do anything for, for, for ECW. But like the one time we, I did a. Paulie comes up to me and goes, uh, come up to the studios, we're gonna recreate the gold dust promo with a naked one he's covered with the bell. And uh, <laughs> I was doing blue dust at the time, so I was total pair of gold dust. So 
we got to go. We go up to New York. Uh, I had to get painted my whole body, blue paint. Oh, I forget the paint, right? So, <laughs> and Sam is here. Me, he forgot the paint. You know, so me and Tommy Dreamer, the king of hardware, go to the local supermarket to buy uh, cake icing and blue food dye. <laughs> in the house of hardware, yeah. So, uh, long story short, Tommy Dreamer and Mr. Hardcore were standing in Ron phone with the, the TV studio, his parents' house. I'm in my underwear, and Tommy's putting blue cake icing on me. And then we have to walk from there two blocks to a local park, a little neighborhood park. <coughs> Why not? And it's summer, and there's gnats. <laughs> Good luck eating later. Yeah. Uh, amen. So, uh, so I, I stripped down to my gimmicks. I got I had a little boomy on cover my gimmick, and uh, we do a run through the promo once, twice. We just had to redo because you know somebody fought the line or whatever, and uh, you know I, I I do a little you know <sighs> bio dust and Paul kind of came up to me because somebody kind of fought the line, but I didn't lose my composure and go ah crap I stayed in the character <sighs> blue dust and, you know cut Paulie's giving me this that was great you stayed in the moment <laughs> and the police spotlight shines right on us. <laughs> The cops show up and step going like this. I went, ah! <laughs> of course. I'm naked, covered in blue cake icing. There's Paul Heyman, Raven. Stevie, who's holding two feather dusters, I don't know why. <laughs> Sandman, his wife, and their child. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler Pullington, and a camera crew. It looked like a, a demented porno going down. Cop comes up and goes, and he must have grew up in Mary because he looks like I just ruined his childhood <laughs> laying on this like little bridge in between the slide and the swings. He goes, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but I don't want to do the paperwork. <laughs> schedule where it's just you're in the airport at like 6 a.m. and you know, whatever. A wrestler really appreciates, uh, I mean, just allowing you to just be you, really. Because I work for promoters. <laughs> when I, 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 me and Stevie flew out to do a show in California where we're going to wrestle Christopher Daniels and Bobby Bradley. and. It was at a wine and cigar party in the Biltmore Hotel. Everybody's in ties and cummerbunds, and there's a table and they're, you know, sipping their wine. Halfway through the end, the protocol comes up and goes, I want you guys to go out there and just beat the shit out of each other. I'm like, it's work, right? So, yeah, he flew us in on a crappy flight. We, we didn't get to our hotel after the show. I only got like an hour of sleep, and I had to fly back to Philly. Got back to Philly, and we drove from the airport straight to Jim Thorpe. Whereas we got in the building, our opponent was going to the ring, and we're getting dressed as, as he's going to the ring. I'm talking my paint on something about the man. Just uh, whatever you could do to make things comfortable. Just uh, whether it's a flight or you know, use, you know, if the guys used to fly in one airline. Stick with that. So mileage or hotels and all that stuff and just uh, 
have a show that's not 80 matches long. You know, there's nothing worse, and there's nothing worse than being on a show where they're having their own personal WrestleMania every month, and you're in match 15, and of course you're going to last because you're they, they're the guy they trust to become the poster, and like halfway through the show, you know, there's nothing worse than to finish your match happening instead of people going, yeah, they're putting on their jackets and they got to leave because, god damn, it's one o'clock in the morning, you know? Uh, for, for a show, perfect, no more than seven matches, no more than that, you know? Just make a wrestling show a part of the evening, don't make it the evening. Make it to the point where a couple, a guy can bring his girlfriend and go, hey, hon, let's go watch the show, wrestle show. And then after the wrestle show, we could go out to dinner, have drinks, blah, blah. Make it a part of the evening, you know? You know? Don't, don't make it to where people are like looking at their watches going, oh my God. You know? And then whoever you don't use on that show, you can use them next time. You know, you don't have to use all your friends. You don't have to use every single wrestler in the state because they live down the street. Have a, have a show that's tailored. Seven matches no more, two hours. Everybody has fun. Have an after party where like the you know the fans can come and meet the wrestlers. Because after each every study show, we would party with the fans. You know, and that's how kind of my character got over because they saw me as one of them, you know. So that's how it came in the ass when when a when a promoter says to you, hey, we got a sponsor afterwards or we're doing an after party, that's how it came in the ass to you. That's Free food and booze? <laughs> Maybe feel at home, you know, because we're so used to being lonely and by ourselves, and you're sitting in a hotel. It's like Groundhog Day. You're just waiting to go to the building, waiting to go to the airport, waiting for my luggage that's lost. You know, make it an experience. Make it to show the experience of what could be a break. Like that couple that comes out that might have wanted drinks and dinner after your show, they'll come to your sponsor, you know? Yeah, Manny hit most of it already. I don't have much more to add. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. Uh, <laughs> oh. um, no, in a good way. Um, after party? So even if I'm in a town where I have like my go-to spot, like my favorite restaurant, and oh, I'm working that town, I'd love to go there. Uh, and there's an after party and there's a sponsor and that's what you gotta do. That, who, like me, it was like, who minds, you know, the free food, drink, whatever. It was my party. Yeah, I mean, being social like that and blowing off steam after the show, like, I would say 98 times out of 100, that's never a problem. Compared to, don't, for an eight o'clock show that's 10 minutes from the airport, Please don't put me on a flight that leaves my home airport at 4, 10 in the morning where I'm going to Albany by way of Auckland, New Zealand because you're saving $25. And <laughs> Is Tony Green here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, From Auckland, New Zealand. <laughs> be, uh, be flexible on your business model. Uh, when we negotiate, uh, listen. Um, you know, as you're trying to convince me how best I can help myself help you, take a moment to help yourself help me. Uh, if there's an opportunity that can be organically without being ham-handed, if there's an opportunity for me to sell some merch, and it's not going to take any money, you know, not, to, you know, it's a business, but uh, there's a competition or whatever, but, you know, long story short, if it's no skin off your ass, but it might send me home with extra money that doesn't have to come out of the office's budget or your pocket, please do. Um, like, kind of like busy setting you up for an appearance somewhere before the show? That's perfect. Which helps promote the show yeah. as well. That's perfect. Be flexible just in your business, like, <clears throat> every promoter is like, what's your rate, or what's your fee? 
So our lives change, they're in a constant state of flux, we have stuff going on in our personal lives, I, you know, I got a cat, if I'm not around, somebody's gotta feed the cat, or the cat's gonna take over the apartment, it's like piggy and brain, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like, there's like, you're not, like, I love wrestling, this is, and I learned my lesson from when I was like, oh, TV's today, I don't want to go do TV today. And then six months later, there was no company. At least I learned from it. And now, you're not paying me to perform. You're paying me for the day that I'm not in my house, I'm not running errands, I'm not in my bed sleeping that night, I'm not with my wife, I'm not with the cat, I'm not watching stuff on the DVR so that tomorrow stuff has room to record. Like, you're, you're, you know what I mean? You're not paying me to perform, you're paying me to, to appear, but for my time. You know, so as such, I'm not going to be unreasonable, but I so much have a flat rate or a fee, because if you stand to make, in profit, thousands upon thousands of dollars versus hundreds upon hundreds of dollars, then I'm still not looking at your show as a yacht payment for a yacht that I don't have or as a lottery ticket. But if you're going to make money, I would enjoy making money if it's going to be no skin off of your ass. So I like when I'm negotiating with a promoter to, you know, uh, how, how many people does your building hold? Oh, you're doing this in a building that holds 3,000 instead of 300? And know your audience, right? What are you hoping to accomplish? What's available? So my fee, my rate, when I don't have one, it constantly changes because it's always case by case. And that's a negotiation, and I don't wrestle but like you were saying, if the boys are gonna negotiate and have a dance in the back, oh, I like your idea, but maybe could I get the, if there's that dance that happens in the back before the one in the ring, then for me, you talk about maybe it's not character development, but it's more like, you know, fiscal business, that kind of thing, governing, you know, then for me, that's my dance is usually with the promoter and, and you know, just trying to, again, not shoot the moon and not try to take any money out of his pocket that I'm, that I, I've never, the one thing I never want a promoter to feel like when I cash a check or when I get the cash or the PayPal, whatever it is, I don't want that promoter to be like, yeah, not next time because I lost money on that guy. I will, and I tell promoters when I negotiate with them, money will not come out of your pocket. I want as much money to go into mine as possible, but as much as possible of it, not from yours, and I don't ever want to have the feeling when I'm getting compensated for your show that I've ripped you off and taken a dollar that I didn't earn. So that's what I like from promoters is a little bit of flexibility, uh, not a rate or a fee, but more a negotiation and put a business model in front of me. What are you hoping to get? And then I know the small piece of that that I can fairly hope to get. All right, I see we still have a number of questions. We're, let's uh, do these kind of rapid fire because we are already uh, a little over an hour here. So let's go back to front. Let's go here. Let's go here. And then we'll go here. And then we'll pick it up from there. But please be uh, concise with your question. And we're going to round these off right? rapid fire. Please. Go. Oh, OK. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Off to great start. All right. Now. With the people, when you were in UCW, who would you like to work with? And then the notice that you got when ECW was closed. Uh, every night I worked with Tracy, Tracy Smothers was a, a lesson. Uh, I love Tracy Smothers. Uh, not only he's an unsung hero of ECW, uh, he would take the boys in the ring before every show and coaches. So my answer every night, I worked for him every night of the year. Tracy Smothers. Or my dad. <laughs> I, I loved working with, I don't want to offend anybody and leave them off, so I mean, so many people that, uh, but as a talker, what first comes to mind, because they kept me on my toes, and I treated it as like sibling rivalry or friendly competition, um, 
I knew it wasn't going to be a walk in the park to stay over, and I knew that I was going to have to be on my toes when I worked back and forth on the mic, whether it's TV, house show, whatever, with both Cyrus and Jamie Dundee. Because those were guys that I would love as a mark in my off time to sit back and have on my TV set, and I would love to watch them talk, and I would love to hear them work. So I would say probably decent answer I could give right now would be Cyrus and Jamie Dundee. All right, I think we're here next. Yeah, uh, do you ever get to a moment where you're lost in your gimmick and you become that gimmick, you become Joey Bag of Donuts or Freddie Smith and you forget about uh, John Smith. You become the gimmick and two, did you ever get to that moment where you go and you're looking around living the dream, you sign the contract, you get in the PO, but then you're like, maybe I sold my soul, I don't know about this. Uh, yeah, you always get lost in your gimmick because like I said, my, my gimmick and character is pretty much me with the volume turned up, but some of their best moments are the ones you don't plan. You know, people are like saying, oh, what are you playing for your summer? I was like, I don't know, we'll call it in the ring. And there's been plenty of times where uh, fans would chant something, and I feed off that, and then people still talk about 25 years later. You know, some I can't repeat because, you know, I wouldn't keep it friendly, but, you know, stuff like that. Uh, what was the second question? I'm sorry. Uh, well, you're living your dream, you're doing everything, but you realize you maybe you didn't realize what it was. You signed the line, kind of sold your soul maybe. You had that moment of like, whoa, what am I getting into? No, it was just a uh, sign. Dude, I tell the story all the time that this is a bridge, a bridge story. Everybody says, oh, I paid my dues in this business. Well, our families pay dues in this business too. And while I was off being a professional wrestler, my mom and grandma helped me support my wrestling habit. So the greatest day in my life was getting the call from Bruce Pritchard saying, be at TV Sunday, Sunday night eat. And I walked from my bedroom to the living room. And I told my grandma, put all the bills in my name. And she said, why? I said, I just signed with the WWE. And yeah, know. you talk about, you see, like, like this weekend, the NFL draft, and you see people on their phones with their families and they're crying. My, my, my grandma's knees just buckled. She was floored. You know, put all the bills in my name. And for the last two years of her life, she didn't have to lift one finger for anything. So sign in that contract. Best day of my life. And those are the people that whether they support us, right, they let us stay with them, live with them, room board if it's that, or whether it's just emotionally it takes a strain on them, they're turning on the TV and they see you cut up or lit on fire or put through a table or whatever. You know, we're paying dues and, and, and we're paying the price, you know, they're paying tolls. You know, it takes a toll. It can take a toll on your family. Not, I love wrestling. I wouldn't do anything else. I mean, not, you know, not, it's not that kind of speech, but it's just, you know, like you say, I mean, you're taking care of her. I'm sure it never ran through your head not to because, you know. She didn't think twice about helping me, so I turned the tables and did everything I do, could do to help her. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, falling away into your gimmick and just kind of staying there, no, I, look, I'm kind of like the quintessential stud muffin. I have a, I'm the one that writes the promos, so obviously I have a similar sense of humor, even in my off time. I, just, I, I think none of us could ever honestly, unless we don't realize it, we, we wouldn't realize it's the wrong answer maybe, but it's the wrong answer to ever say you're nothing like your character. Because you produce your, you know what I mean? If you can produce your character, there's got to at least be one little seed in your brain that is that character. Um, we had, it, even as the last territory, ECW, we had it a lot easier than the guys who were on the road 350 days a year, uh, the territory guys. Uh, they had to live their gimmick, you know? Anybody who's watched Dark Side of the Ring recently, you know what I mean? Randy Savage was Randy Savage. <laughs> Bruiser Brody went through the airport doors, and he wasn't Frank Goodish anymore, he was Bruiser Brody. And, and that's the way it was, and it was that way, 
You know, if you were police for the office, if you were the guy that would need to stretch a fan if they got in the ring, or, you know, stretch a student that's out of line at the school, or whatever. Okay. If you were police, you were police. If you were a tough guy and a brawler, you were a tough guy and a brawler. I mean, I wasn't there, but urban legend for like Mid-South UWF Bill Watts is that if you didn't want to work there anymore, you wanted to ticket out, the best thing you could do if you were a brawler type is not live up to your gimmick and be who you were because it was loser leaves town if any fan ever approached you at the bar. If you ever were at the bar after the show and you're Dickie Murdoch and a fan wants to have shit with you and they want to get into it and you're having a bad day and you don't hold your own and word circulates throughout town the next day that you got beat up by a civilian, that's loser leaves town and you're out of the territory. So we had, we were the last territory, depending how you measure to an extent, but it was already the mid to late 90s. Things had already changed in a certain way in the business. It was a different time. Uh, not a different business, but a different time. But I like to say that they paid tolls and prices and dues that we didn't have to pay. They paved the road and laid the groundwork and lived a harder lifestyle so that we were blessed not to have to, I think. All right, now we're here next. Let's do two more questions after that, and then we'll call it. We'll go here, right back there, and then last question right there. Fire away. Okay, obviously this question's for everybody, but as a manager like myself, um, you know, you, you've got your name established, you've got who you are, and then another promotion says to you, I like your look, I like this, I like that, but I want your name to be this, I want your gimmick to be this. So obviously, if you look the same, your fans know you from your original gimmick, so now you're working two different gimmicks, so to speak. You're working for that company as that one gimmick, then you're working everywhere in the house from your original gimmick. What's the best way to keep them separate?